Any uh, <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> um, all right, so this is titled God's Word, Reading the Ifs, Ands, and Buts. Um, and this is kind of like, it kind of goes with what we talked about at the Bible study the other week. Um, <clears throat> I was talking about the apostles and where they had traveled and where they went. And in that, I um, brought up the fact that um, Paul, at one point, Paul Barnabas, and um, I think Matthias was with him too, uh, was going to venture into a country, a land, uh, I think it was called Mythia. Uh, and in there, there was a t uh, city called uh, Bithynia, uh, if I'm saying that right. But anyway, but it says that we decided to go there, and then it says, but the Spirit suffered us not. And I've often, you know, as we talked about the Bible study, those that were here, sorry you're hearing this again, but um, I pointed out the fact that by showing, the Scripture showing us where these different um, apostles went, and showing us also what Jesus said these apostles would do, what he wanted them to do, what he gave them to do. And I showed you that Paul was to go to the Gentiles and preach before kings and then to the lost tribes of Israel. And the apostles were all told to go to the lost tribes of Israel. Well, Paul was getting ready to go into an area that was where the lost tribes were, and it wasn't time for him to do that. That was his last part of his commission, was to go to the lost tribes of Israel. So anyway, it kind of answered that whole uh, question of, I wonder why they couldn't go in there, you know? And more than likely, I probably read it before, and I thought, probably somebody in there that was going to kill them, and God didn't want them killed yet. Yeah, I got this figured out. But no, it's not. It's because he was going where he wasn't supposed to go. And so the Spirit told him, no, you're not going there. And he said, okay, we're not going there, guys. Change of plans. So they went somewhere else. And what I'm going back over that for and what I'm, what I'm getting to is, um, I don't know whose this is, but it was good that it's here. This book, this book, all these words in this book mean something to us. They show us things. They teach us things. Cord was talking about that, too. Um, very similar, a little different, but very similar. I won't be uh, making you feel bad. So, <laughs> um, but this book is everything. And if you cannot believe that this is the inspired word of God, you're wasting your trying, time trying to know God. Because this is his word to us. And this is what we follow. And when somebody says, why do you keep the Sabbath? We don't go because just kind of got this feeling that maybe God wants me to. He said, because God's word says to do it. And that's why we do it. We don't follow a man. We follow a God, a creator, and our savior. That's what we follow. So this means so much to us. The words that we read, the words that we find. And, you know, I have probably read, I'd venture to say I probably read more about the lost tribes of Israel than anyone in this room. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But I've probably read 10 or 12 books on it. And not all of them were small. Not many of them were small. And I have probably read a ton of articles about it. Tons of them. The most. <laughs> um, but anyway, that was a joke to me. Um, but I still had not figured that out until I started getting into writing what I wrote for that Bible study, is when it, I was like, duh, this makes sense now. And that's what it, what it was all about. So this is called God's Word, because that's what I'm talking about, the fact that this is where everything is. Okay? It's all here. And from the assistance of someone who's maybe speaking, someone else you're just talking to. And mostly from the Holy Spirit. It's where you get the explanations, where things come to you. They, they cross your mind. They hit upon you and go, oh, wow. 
I mean, it's like Cord was saying that he's always talking about the talents, and he does. He brings that up a lot. Um, and what I'm going to go through today, I'm going to go through some of Matthew 24 about the end times. And that seems to be a, a big thing that I have gotten hooked on here over the last year. And uh, y'all have heard those things, and I'm not going to really be talking about those things or those dates or numbers or anything. But And it kind of scared me when I first was thinking about what I was going to talk about. And I was like, and that kept coming back to me. And I was like, oh, man, they're going to shoot me if I go in there and start talking about the end times again. But it's, I'm not going to be talking about the end times. I'm just going to be using those scriptures to talk to us and to show us things. And one thing I want to start out with is it's, it's, it's a little bit of the Bible that you can use when you're talking with somebody and they are not in the church and they are um, talking to you about that rapture that's coming, that great and mysterious secret rapture that they learned about from some man long ago, and it's just gone on and on and on. I actually saw somebody put it out there not too long ago. He took a piece of paper, and he drew a line. It was supposed to be a timeline, and he had Jesus returns, the kingdom and all, and then he went back, and he had the tribulation, and then he I was on the other side of the tribulation. He put rapture. Because if you don't know it, I'll explain it real quick. Like The reason there's going to be a tribulation is because they preach out there that all God's people will be raptured and when no good people remain on the earth, evil will take over. Folks, I'm here to tell you, evil's already taken over this world. It ain't going to take over. It has taken over. With all these good people in it, it has still taken over. So they need to stop and take another look. And in Matthew 24, here's your argument. We're going to start in verse 21. It says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. Great tribulation. But this is happening because they're all gone. All us Christian people are gone. That's why this is happening in their theory. So keep stay with me. And 22 says, and except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved but the elect's sake. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And then you stop and you look at them and you say, hey, you're, you're a saved Christian, right? And they would go, yes, I am. And you say, so you consider yourself an elect, one of God's elected? And he would go, yes, he or she. I want to be fair here. Don't want to offend nobody. Then you say, well, what's this? When the, there shall be great tribulation and he's going to shorten the days to save the elect. But you said you were raptured. You're still here. If you are the elect. And then you go on and you say, then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ or there, believe it or believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And now, brother, you just told me you consider yourself the elect because you're saved, right? And we're into the tribulation, and it's terrible. And he's saying they could, that that time could uh, deceive the very elect. I'm not getting this whole rapture before the tribulation thing. And then you go on and you say, 25, Behold, I have told you before. And these are all Christ's words. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. And then the verse changes and says, Immediately, after the tribulation. Okay, brother, are you following me? We're after the tribulation. It says, Of those days shall the sun be darkened, 
and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from the heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man. And we do agree that that's Jesus Christ, right? Yeah. In the clouds of heaven and pow with power and great glory. Here's the kicker. And then he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, brother, please explain to me how you're raptured before the tribulation. And I just showed you, and you agreed you're an elect, and all us Christians are elects. And you're living through the tribulation. And then even after the tribulation, at a point in time, Jesus comes and sends his angels to collect, to resurrect his elect. So this is valuable stuff that's right here in your scripture that you can argue with somebody. And I hate to use the word argue, um, but you can discuss with somebody and you can show them. You pull out the word of God and you turn to it in Matthew and you say, look, I, let me, I, I'm not trying to be mean to you. And then when they get done and they want to give you some, if they want to still give you argument, or if they go and talk to their preacher or whatever, or their mental giant on the Bible, and they come back and say, well, he said this. You go, he said that, yes, but God said what I read to you that day. God said that. I did not change. I did not fight that person, but with nothing more than the word of God. And again, I probably shouldn't use the word fight, because it's a discussion is what it should be. But you might be talking to a liberal, so it's going to be a fight. Um, so it's just, it's just looking at the Word of God and reading it, taking it in, let the Spirit talk to you, let it move you. I mean, this is something that we read through a lot, but we just kind of, boom, breeze on through it. And then you stop and you think about it when you think about there's a resurrection, we know, because Scripture tells us. Scripture does not mention rapture. So here, there's your answer. It's Matthew um, 24, starting in verse 21, down to verse 31. And it's a sweet little simple way letting God's word work for your what you're trying to accomplish for that person. And again, that's, that's the whole reason we don't really want it to be an argument and a fight because we're not trying to be mean to that person. We're trying to help them to understand God's word and to come to the true meaning. Okay? Now, there's things that you need to... I'll, I'm not going to bring that up yet. I'm going to bring it up in a minute when I get to that, those verses. Because now we're going we're gonna to change a little bit. We're going to go back up in, in, verse, or in chapter 24, Matthew. And it says... Um, we're going to go to verse 24. And it says, and some of these things I'm going to maybe give you an answer, and some of them I'm just going to give you some thoughts. And I'd be curious to know your answers or your thoughts. If you think it's good, bad, indifferent, right, wrong, whatever. But in verse, tw in verse 4 of Matthew 24, it says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For any man shall come in my name, for many men shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. I think we can all agree that that's happening right now. Then shall they... Deliver you to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. We would agree that my name's sake is Jesus Christ, right? So who's going to be killed, afflicted, and hated? Who are these people? Most of the time I've talked to people in the church, in our types of churches, it's uh, they usually they usually say that's us that's us the true Christians of God 
It doesn't say I'm going to get those people to keep the Sabbath and the holy days. It says those people, for my name's sake, are going to be hated and killed and persecuted. So that's anybody. That's your friend who does not believe what you told him about the rapture and still goes to church on Sunday. But he believes in Jesus Christ. He believes in God Almighty. That, that guy is going to be persecuted too. Now you're thinking a little bit. I can see some heads out there thinking. Okay? Because I'm sorry, but that's what it says. And they already do that. They kill people in other countries right now because they go, we follow God in Jesus Christ. We have a cross. And they chop their head off. They burn them. I read something the other day. I'm not sure how soon ago it was, but talked about how they poured gasoline on some Christians uh, <clears throat> by some Muslims and burn them. All dead. Um, but that's what they did. All right, those people died for the name of Jesus Christ. Okay? This is where you got to start separating things. and you got to start making decisions about what the scripture is telling you. You know? I mean, we all want to believe, and I've got that in here. And we'll get to it. And I'll ask you the questions there. But, they believe in Christ. They're following him. They're making some mistakes along the way. But they're just like us. And if we're standing there wearing a shirt that says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and they see us, they're going to get us too. Okay? But yeah, we're in it. But it's everybody that believes in Jesus Christ and is sticking to their guns. I mean, there's many different ways this could play out at this time. We don't really know all of it, but... Just from what I'm reading right there, if you're touting the name of Jesus Christ, you're in trouble. And let's go back and think about this some. Matthew 5, verse 17. Y'all want to go there? I got about four or five. Well, you go there because the last verse uh, I'll bring up is, a, is another question. Um, Matthew 5, verse 17. Think not that I, can't, I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall, not in, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least, these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And you've heard me talk about this before. And I think that this here shows us two types of Christians. Those that are believing in Jesus Christ and God, the Father. And they are following his word to the best of their ability. These people are breaking the commandments, and they're teaching others to break. They blatantly say, no, you don't have to do those anymore until you start singling them out. Mainly they say, they're just telling you that you don't have to do the Sabbath and the holy days, and you can have symbols because they've got to have their crosses and stuff. But they do speak of evil done by men. That God would say, I don't like this. Then there's us, those in the churches of God, um, that have the faith in Jesus Christ and keep the commandments of God. So, I think how I'm going to put this together and tie it in is this. Those that are keeping the commandments of God and have the faith in Jesus Christ or first resurrection. They're being called great in the kingdom of God. Those that are not have to go through the second gener uh, resurrection. It's a 50-50 shot. They don't know if they're going to have eternal life or not. You know, there may be some people that do the right thing and are, they're in the first resurrection, even though they haven't kept a Sabbath one their life. I don't know. See, I, that's just me saying I'm not going to judge everybody gray and black. I mean black and white. But the thing is, the very elect 
that he spoke of in those verses earlier that could be, the very elect could be fooled. I believe that's the people who are keeping God's commandment, following his word in a much more proper manner than those who break the commandments and do not follow his word. Okay? Now, again, this is a lot of my opinion here, putting some of this together, but it makes sense to me. Number one, it gives me hope by looking at 519. It gives me hope and compassion for those people who cannot bring themselves to understand a Sabbath day, a holy day, and so forth, food laws and things like that of God, and stop saying, it. no, God's not going to make my life hard. I can go and eat some shrimp. It's good, you know? It gives me hope for them. Because before I came to the, this reckoning and this knowledge of this, I always wondered what the hope for them people was. But they have hope too. Our hope stands on a little firmer ground because of what we know about the Bible and what we look at and how we treat these words. We don't mince them. We don't tear them up. We don't take the Bible and rip apart one scripture and put it with another scripture and then maybe a couple more down here and say, see, you don't have to keep the Sabbath or you, or you do have to keep the Sabbath. I'm sorry. No, we keep the Sabbath because it's simply written in there. Keep the Sabbath. It's simply written in the New Testament that there still remains a Sabbath convocation for God's people. And it's said in Revelations that Satan is out to do war on those that have the testimony of Jesus Christ and to keep the commandments of God. You're a peculiar person. We are. Because we don't work like the world does. But we are being set up to be what? Revelations tells us. We are being set up to be kings and priests with Jesus Christ in the millennial reign. We have a purpose. We go through this different life down here to help us to understand, to be better at what we're going to have to do. So what I'm saying here, I hope, is making sense. And I hope that you're kind of following it. We are not superior people. But we are doing what we do for a purpose. For a reason that God has. His scripture all has reason. And by going through his scripture, and you add a little bit of history that can be confirmed somewhat, you can prove parts and things of the Bible. And by going through his scripture and looking at what they're saying here, you can put together a scenario that, to me, makes a little bit more plausible sense than just, oh, they go to church on Sunday, they're all going to burn. Because that makes no sense to me. It never has. But I had a hard time grasping what was going on. But I looked at this verse all the time. And it, it hung on me. And I'm going, why are they called least? Why don't they why didn't just say that they're, they're burnt? But it says they'll be in the kingdom. They're called least in the kingdom of heaven. They're called great in the kingdom of heaven. Great could be first. Least could be second. First and second resurrections. It's just some thoughts. They're in the scripture. And if I'm befuddling you, if you're sitting there thinking, okay, I was on the same page with him, but now I'm not really getting this. I'm not sure. Chris might have lost it. If you're thinking that, then that's your calling right there. You need to get in your Bible and figure it out. And then come tell me if I'm wrong and you can show me with scripture that I'm wrong. By all means, I will accept it. I will accept it. But, you also, if you're sitting there going, I'm not sure if that's right, I'm not sure about that. And you go and look and you go, well, wow. Oh, and I found this verse and this verse. Yeah, it, I, that might be just what he said. Yeah, that, that, that might be. So then you agree and we're on the same page. No problem. You don't come back and tell me, hallelujah, brother, you're so smart. No, you just figured it out because you went to scripture and you studied it. You didn't just read it. Court, I was going to use the words. <laughs> it's pretty weird because he started out talking about lazy people. And I was going to say, 
that you need to read. You remember the subtitle to this is reading the if, ands, and buts. Because they're all through the Bible. It says so-and-so, and then they'll go, but. And we, those little words just go right through our brain. We don't think about them. But, uh, oh, there's a but here. Wait a minute, we've got to figure out what he's saying here. You've got to stop and look. I mean, there's a but in this, this thing. He says, the least in the kingdom of heaven. But, whosoever shall do and teach the same shall be called great. You've got to read the if, ands, and buts. You've got to read the shalls. And there's other words. It's just a, that's a phrase, if, and, and but. So I just used that. But it's in here. And it's meant to be studied. It's meant to be looked at in depth. I mean, Cord has had a couple of uh, sermons where he stayed in just one chapter, one parable, and he read it. And he came up with some really interesting thoughts on that that I had not thought of. I had never looked at it and read it and gone, well, this, I can't think of one right now, but, uh, I, but I know he's had a couple where he's done that. But he just sticks in the scripture right there and flows with it and hunts down the word and picks it out. How many times do we do that? Or do we just go, hmm, well, that looks like an interesting place. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us rend it, but cast lots for it. Oh, this is talking about where they crucified Jesus. Okay. But I just turn there and start reading. Okay? Or even if you've got a a year-long reading schedule and you go through that you know it's just something you're you're just reading it find out why they said it find that if you can you may not but this book is here for us to look at to go through and to understand and we don't understand it all I got one at the end that is not going to be understood I don't really fully think maybe but there's stuff going on here. So by using those two verses and using what I read above, I feel like they tie together. I feel like they come together in, in showing us what he's meaning, what's going on here. Now, in that same set of verses in Matthew 5, verse 20 says, For I say unto you that, here's a word, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. What are we doing wrong that the Pharisees and the scribes were doing that we need to do better? Because it, it's telling us if we don't, we're not going to see the kingdom of heaven. Are we doing what he says exceeding their righteousness? And I'm not saying we're not. I'm not saying that. But this is written here for a reason. And it's also one of those things that you just kind of blow over. You just kind of, okay, read it. Exceeding. Yeah, I'm better than a scribe and Pharisee. I'm not, nobody ever called me a Pharisee. You know, but maybe not. Are we sure? The Pharisees did the commandments and stuff. They kept the Sabbaths and the holy days. But they didn't have other things. They didn't have knowledge and belief of Jesus Christ, obviously. And then love and hope and those things like that that the Bible talks about. And they didn't understand and they didn't want to listen to it. And those things were in their, in their scrolls. Because remember, everything that they talk about and everything they refer to scripturally in the New Testament, everything Jesus preached comes from the Old Testament. And some things he made new, yes, but they were his words then, but his, the scriptures he used were Old Testament. The scriptures Paul used were Old Testament. Remember, Philip talking to the eunuch. He started in Isaiah and preached Jesus Christ. And many people would go, Isaiah is a tough read. This is one of my favorite books. But that's where the scripture came from, and that's how you get it. And remember, God says that his word will not return to him without doing what he wanted it to do. His word is not lazy. His word is not um, a sluggard. His word is powerful and it's active. And if he wants it to go out from your mouth to somebody and it's going to get them and bring them to him, then he's going to make it happen. Somebody's going to say what he wants said so that person will get it right if that's what he wants to do. 
then again, he might just send out the word just to see how they'll react. And if they react wrong, maybe then he's going to say, okay, I guess they didn't have what I thought. I don't know. But this stuff, it's like TNT, man. This stuff is awesome. You've got to be able to understand it. But you won't understand it. It's kind of like you're not going to win the lottery if you don't buy a ticket. I guarantee you. I can guarantee you that. If you don't read this, you're not going to be doing, you're not going to be able to do what Cord was talking about. You're not going to be able to, to do what he wants you to do because you're turned off. You're unplugged. You're out of tune with him. But when you're reading his word, when you're studying his word, when you're thinking on it, you're in tune. You're plugged in. You've got a channel open. Just listen. Just feel the feeling. Okay? You know, the spirit is, you've all heard me say this, it's so awesome. And when that spirit gets in you and that thing gets going, you know it's the spirit. You know it's from God. You don't hear voices. It doesn't just move your hand all of a sudden. But you get the feeling, you get the vibes, you get the notions in your head. And you follow it. Much like I was telling you. When I started thinking what I was going to speak of this week, I was like, oh no. I can't talk about end times again. Well, he wasn't talking about end times. He was talking about words that are in his, in his word. The fact that we need to go through them. And you look at them and they mean something else. You know, we took the first set of verses and that's, that's fuel for your discussion with a person that believes in the rapture. And as times go along and things get worse, it's these kind of things that might push people to think, hmm, it may have something here. They're actually reading the Word of God and they're thinking about it and they're looking at it and they're following it. And everything I'm seeing out here is not that great picture that's being painted for me by my minister. Because they do paint a great picture. They don't want to talk about people being beheaded or you're going to be crucified and you're going to be killed in the name of Jesus or for the name of Jesus. That's the truth. It's coming to somebody somewhere. Today, tomorrow, to a bunch of us down the road when that happens, when that tribulation comes, it's coming. And it's all because of his name. And it's already starting. It's, it's rough out there when you start talking about I believe in the Bible. Oh, man, they just want to crucify you right off the get-go. You know, you're allowed to talk about the Koran, but you can't talk about the Bible because it's evil. I mean, look at our, everybody's all hooked on the gadgets. And, you know, I even have one myself. I have a Kindle I got. And I got mine set up at the house, and I got the Alexa on. And I'll, every now and then I'll go, hey, Alexa. What's the weather going to be today? And it gives you a pretty good little synopsis of the weather. And I'll go, Alexa, what's the definition of this word? And it'll give me the definition. That's about it. But everybody else uses it for information. And if you go, Alexa, because I've done this, and I've done it on Google. If you go, Alexa, who is Jesus Christ? She says, religion is such a tough, difficult situation. I, I'll have to learn more about that later. Something to that effect. Alexa, what is Islam? Islam is the religion of Muslims and blah, 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 talking about, and it'll tell you about Allah and Muhammad. So they are setting us up for all the people who read and listen to this stuff all off of electronics that will give them answers about everything but God. Everything but his scripture. This is all we got to follow right now. Other until you get the spirit and you start following that. But the spirit feeds off of this too. This is fuel for the spirit. And until you're doing that, all you got is this. All you got to show somebody else that's trying to learn the truth is this. And it's it's not, some of them are big and heavy. This one's pretty solid. Um, it's not to hit them with, <laughs> uh, although sometimes you may want to. But it's not for hitting them. It's the word of God, you know. 
Um, there's a place in, in Scripture, I didn't put it in here because I didn't know where I was going to be going off on this tangent here, but um, it talks about the two-edged sword, and it is the Word of God. That's what we use to discuss with people. The two-edged sword, the Word of God. And that's how you do it. Because, like I said, his word is made way stronger than our words. So if you're using his word, it's going to do its job, whatever he wants it to do. Now, we don't know this person, so we don't know if he's going, or she, is going to change or are going to come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior and follow God in the proper way. We don't know that. But he does. But, so we still feed them his words, not ours. His way, not ours. That's the way things are done with God. His way, his words, that's it. The more we fight against his way and his word, the more we are going to have some really hard times. We should be staying in his way and in his word. Um, in John 16, verse 2 and 3, it says, and I'm going on to a new subject, new thought here. They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he does God service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. And then I'm going to go ahead and read another one right below it. Uh, and this is back over in, um, in Matthew 25, verses 9 through 13. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they shut, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he said, he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. All right, so what I want to bring up here is that there are two places here, and there are, I think there's another one or two that allude to the same thing. Where God says, um, I'm sorry, I, I jumped ahead. Forget the verse in John. I need to read that one, I need to read this one under it. Not everyone that saith, unto, I'm in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So we have two places here, and I, I do go back to what I said earlier. I believe it's mentioned at least one other place, and it's alluded to maybe in a couple other places. Um, that he says, I knew you not. They're trying to get to him, and he says, I knew you not. Um, and the key here is they were trying to get to Jesus. They believed in Jesus. They were trying to get in. The bridegroom represents Christ. And here, in the second one in Matthew uh, 7, they're talking to, to him himself. So... It's interesting, and you have to stop and think about this, and people need to understand that he will say that. He will do that. They want to get in, and he says, I never knew you in the second one, and they were, they were doing many things in his name. And he says, I never knew you. Depart from me. That's strong stuff, man. God ain't playing games. Neither is Christ. Everybody wants to paint this picture of Christ totally being this loving God. He is. But when it gets down to the right moment, he'll flip the tables over on you and make a cat of nine tails. 
And the only way you're going to figure it out is in here. In the Word of God. That's it. I mean, this may be a little... Everybody kind of already knows this. I don't know, but... Um, if you don't get into those scriptures, if you don't follow them. All right, let's get on to this one here. Matthew 25, and starting in verse 31. And this will be, after this one, I think we're going to be... This is a little long, though. We'll be getting close to getting done. Y'all getting hungry. Uh, Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in? Or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in, present, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king, Christ, shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done this, done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And then he goes on in verse 41. It says, Then shall he say unto those on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee unhungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then he answers them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So, have we done the right thing? Are we the sheep? Are we the goat? Have we looked at this scripture and pulled it apart? Because this is, this is um, a lot said here, over and over, about the same thing. It, um, it's a long story, a long parable. And it ends with some going into death and some going into eternal life. Do you stop and think about things when we read these long, lengthy things? And he, he goes through all the stuff that you did for me, and then they repeat it back. When did we do all these things to you? And then he answers it short and simple. And then he goes, and you guys, you did none of this to me. And he names it all again. And they kind of shorten it up on that one and say, when did we do any of this stuff and not minister? When did we see you this way? And it comes down to, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. So, what's he saying? Are we taking care of one another? And him? Are we getting it right? This one is something you need to go and think about. This is something, because I ain't done with it. Um, I'm talking about in my head. There's a lot here to be learned, and it needs to be looked at. Are we getting it right? I do not want to be told I knew you not. And I hope and pray that I'm getting it right. I hope we all are getting it right. But we need to make sure. And the only way to make sure 
is in here again. I'm sure you're probably tired of me holding it up, but it's getting heavy. Uh, there's a lot there. There's got to be something to be found. And then that goes on with all the scripture, all the parables, all the stories. It brings out different things each time. All right, we'll close up on these two scriptures. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture. Okay? Now God's even telling you in his own scripture that this book is valuable to you. It's for everything. It's for righteousness, reproof, correction. It's doctrine. This is everything right here. That's why this book has survived for so many years. And any changes anybody tried to make to them have been found out, and God has shown his people what they really mean. It's, I mean, they've tried to destroy the book, and they can't. And it works still to this day. This is how I came to the truth, by reading this. And it wore me down. And I was like, God, okay, I don't need to win this argument anymore. I just want to know what the truth is. And he showed me. And I'm a much happier person now than I was. Although sometimes you may not know that or realize it, but I am. And last verse, Revelations 1.3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. He's coming. He's coming soon. We may or may not be alive, but we may have to endure some of this. And we are supposed to be the elect that cannot be deceived, but it would be close if he didn't shorten those days. So we have to be prepared. And the only preparation is through his word. Prayer, meditation, belief, and following him. Doing it his way, not our way. The scripture is for us. It's the truth, the way, and the light. To Jesus Christ, our Lord, brother, and Savior. That's what it's for. And I should probably add to that, eternal life with him. It's worth every jot and tittle that's in it. Read it.